Hello, I'm Tim Harris. This is Julie Harris, and this is Real Estate Coaching Radio. That's right. So make sure that you hit the subscribe button so you won't miss any future episodes. Thanks again for popping by. Hit that like button, and don't forget to leave your comments and questions so we can get right back with you. We will. Thank you for continuing to make our podcast, Real Estate Coaching Radio, the number one listened to podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. And let us know what you think about this video. Leave your comments below. Thank you. Three, two, one, and we are back, and this is part two, and we're talking about, frankly, we're sharing with you the top 10 reasons. It looks like now I'm looking at Julie's list. It might be 11 reasons. Bonus. <laughs> yeah, bonus bonus uh, 11 coming up. Why agents fail to take listings, and hopefully we've convinced you that this is not something you need to or want to learn on the job because the cost of making any of these mistakes in many of your markets is over 10000 In other words, you, took a, you missed taking a listing. You lost on a competitive listing appointment because you did not, frankly, um, prepare. You did not pre-qualify. You did not present. You did not you know, follow the process, our seven-step listing process, and the seller chose somebody else. And when that house sold, had you gotten it, you would have made at least $10,000. That is an expensive mistake. I don't care where you come from. And it just accordingly because a lot of you listening have multi-million dollar uh, listing opportunities in front of you that when you don't take a listing you're losing fifty a hundred thousand dollars do not make these mistakes it's too expensive <laughs> yeah and that assumes that there was only one transaction it might have been two that you lost right exactly and also Julie I want to uh, say this too uh, we did get a lot of people that uh, texted me yesterday about being in your schedule uh, Julie hasn't called all of them back yet but remember, when you're texting me, if you want to be personally coached by Julie, she thinks she has three spots uh, left. We are, uh, you know, we're going to pre-qualify you guys, frankly. You're going to text me first. Don't be surprised. And when you do text me, say, I'm interested in being coached by Julie and give me some information about you and your business. It really does help tremendously. And then you and I will have a little conversation. Um, and then I'll give you uh, everything you need to know as to whether or not Julie would be a good fit for you or not. And then, assuming she is, then you have another call, uh, conversation with her and you can interview her and she can interview you. And if it's a good fit, then you guys move forward together. Not everybody's a good fit, frankly. A lot of people are going to be, um, frank, they're not going to be ready for Julie. And so, and that's not a bad thing because you set a plan for them that yes. they might start with one of our other coaches. And, and then once they've gotten a certain uh, skill set developed, then they can uh, readdress talking with you as your coach. That's right. We're actually quite specific about that. So just because you might not be a match for me doesn't mean you're not a match for coaching. We will help you determine what the best path is. That's right. So if you're interested in being coached by uh, Julie Harris, who many have considered to be the number one real estate coach in the nation, and she wrote 90% of our best-selling book called Harris Rules, please do text me directly at 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206. Oh, it, yes, Julie is open to coaching somebody who is newer, uh, provided you have the right, frankly, mindset uh, to your real estate business. And, and give me an example of what someone would say less than three years experience in real estate. And maybe they've been successful. Maybe they've sold like five or six houses per year. But why wouldn't they be a good fit for you? If they are wanting to fight about, you know, a coach, whether it's me or one of our other coaches, telling them exactly what to do, how to do it, when to do it, and what to do it with, if they want to argue about that versus taking the proven path which will shorten their learning curve. If, if they're looking to be contentious, we're not interested. Uh, we do this for a living. This is all we do all day long. And by the way, we all have actually sold real estate. So there's that. I'll tell you guys a funny story. So um, Julie and I, are, uh, go we go to the gym most days, and we befriended an ex-professional um, baseball player. <laughs> What's his name? Angel. Angel Pagan. Angel Pagan. You guys can Google him. He's played like six major league teams and these – you know, I mean, frankly, I think I, he played for the Boston Red Sox or he something. Did. Yeah. yeah. And a whole bunch of other teams too. It played out. I think he played for the Dodgers. Like and, played for reals. Yeah. For reals. Right. And he looks like it too. Let's just be Definitely. honest. Um, and so he's kind of taken an interest in Julie and I. And so he started to show Julie and I some of the things that we're doing wrong, which fortunately isn't very many things, but now he's starting to show us these things that frankly are 100% um, they'd be illegal. Uh, and you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the, the, it's so torturous. Some of the, he had us balancing on a BOSU ball, if you guys know what that is, it's just basically like this gel-filled, you know, torture device, and <laughs> and, and a um, what would you call what would you call another basically another ball, yeah, like and, a yoga ball type and, thing, and then doing um, what was planks. it? Planks. Planks. Yeah, that's easy. Yeah, I was yeah. hurting for three days after that. I know. And then the balancing on one leg business, like stuff that you never would come up with on your own. 
that your average trainer isn't going to ask you to do. And we've had plenty of trainers. And if this guy, professional athlete, knows what the hell he's doing. He now in very short, you know, he's a couple times he's shown us how to do things. We've learned more. Uh, to the, we've learned so much to the point that we're intimidated by him, frankly, because <laughs> we like to think that we had our act together when it came to actually working out. But he's making us feel uh, consciously incompetent. Very much so. <laughs> which is really what a great coach and trainer is. But we're not arguing with him, I think, is yeah, your exactly. original point. We're not <laughs> arguing with him, though I think we are trying to avoid him, if we're being honest. <laughs> well, which is natural when you're around good coaches, because you know they're going to get you out of your comfort zone. That's exactly 100% what I'm trying to say is uh, what you are signing up for <laughs> if you guys are interested in being coached by Julie. You don't have time to waste in this market. If this is something which, you know, you're frank, you're finally ready to really step up to your full potential, do consider being coached by Julie. She's not going to take on a bunch of new clients. You are going to be pre-qualified. And like I said, it is a process, but you can text me directly at 512-758-0206, 512-758-0206. All right, Julie, let's go through our final uh, points today with point number six being first today. Yes, this is the second part of the series, guys. So point number six, and we're talking about mistakes that cause you to not take a listing when you go on the presentation. Mistake number six, you used a canned presentation, or maybe even no presentation, instead of asking what the seller needs and presenting that. What is the most important thing to the seller? We talked about that a lot yesterday, and presenting to that. So here's the secret. It's easier and more effective to present based on what the seller actually values, rather than assuming that you know already. Show respect by asking questions and addressing their real concerns. Versus what many of you are doing, you show up uh, assumptively that you're going to get the listing, you show up with a CMA, you don't really have any, frankly, you're not that professional with presenting the CMA, and the CMA itself might be brilliant with lots of charts and whatnot because there's lots of apps that do that for you, but you don't really know how to ex explain it to the seller, and then you don't have a listing presentation. By the way, you did not pre-qualify the seller ahead of time. You did not know you were competing for that listing. You did not know what the seller's time frame was. You did not actually do your homework before you went on that appointment. Then in the worst case scenario, you were also showing up at the CAM presentation. In other words, your presentation, assuming you even have one, is the exact same one used for every single seller, no matter what. Do you think that's showing respect to that seller? Do you think it's showing respect to that seller's time? Do you think if you're competing, especially with one of our coaching clients, you think you have a shot at getting that listing? Even if this is your best friend from high school, you're not going to take the listing. And I, again, we talked about this yesterday. That's a common profile. A lot of people that are asking to be in Julie's coaching schedule are those of you who've only sold real estate for 15 years or less. You've been successful. Most of your business, you, if you know where it comes from, is mostly from your centers of influence and past clients. And now even they are starting to make you work for the listing or the opportunity. That is just going to get more intense over the rest of this year into, frankly, the years to come. It is time to get your skills on point number seven. Point number seven, this is easy to fix. You showed up late. Being late is a huge mistake. Arriving late shows disrespect and will mean that you have, you're already on bad footing before you even open your mouth. Early is on time, on time is late, and when you're late, you lose. Here's the secret. It's not just analytical types that look to see if you're on time, although especially them. Show up early and don't park in their driveway. Call first to confirm. Be a professional if you expect to be treated like one. Okay, so again, you don't explain why you're saying these things, so let me break this down with Julie's secret. Number one, tell them the story about how you and I were, uh, you know, Julie and I sold real estate, you know, <laughs> for 10 years, between 100 and 200 homes a year, so we're not just fake real estate coaches. Uh, but I remember we went on one listing appointment. I remember. You, you know, I'm going to tell the mind. story. You can, you can tell it. Yeah. You know, go ahead. Well, I think we're thinking of the same one. Uh, and of course, you know, we learned by shadowing people before we even had the advantage of coaching, but we showed up, okay, and we're on time. The seller meets us at the door. He has a yellow legal pad. We see other agents' names with like 508 or 517, the time that they apparently showed up. You got this. You, you got, uh, you told it out of sequence. The seller showed us that they wrote down when the agents that we were competing with mm -hmm. showed up after they decided they were going to list the house with yes. us after we presented. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he didn't show it when we showed up. Yeah. He showed it afterwards. Yes. And so what he said was, I had basically already decided I was going to list with you guys because you showed up a little bit early uh -huh. and everybody showed up late. 
That's right. And you know, that also plays into, and you guys can refer to the previous podcast and coaching, of course, and it's in the Harris Rules book. It's called the seven step listing process, which includes things like call to confirm the appointment, be professional, send the pre-listing package. The thing that you have to remember about winning listings and, and in today's market, listings are more scarce. They're more competitive. They're worth more to everyone. And especially because a lot of your buyer pool is drying up, right? So when you go, and I have this rule for my coaching clients, assuming that you are going on a listing presentation, which you pre-qualified, you did a really killer CMA, maybe you previewed, you've got some work in this. I do expect you to take it 100% of the time. 100%. Do not go through all the effort of getting the appointment, especially if you proactively lead generated and set the appointment yourself, with the expectation you're not going to take every single listing. You should be taking 100% of the appointments you go on when you follow our process. That has to be your mindset. That has to be your approach. And if you don't take a listing for some reason, you do not, you are not allowed as a coaching client to write it off as, well, that seller must have known that the agent they chose because they went to church together. Or that seller must, you know, the agent must have told them a lower, or a lower commission or a higher price. Don't rationalize losing. You won't learn anything. You've got to, again, this is unfortunately a script that we do have in our coaching program. You want to call that seller and ask them why you didn't get the listing. You want to know because that's how you grow. If you want to basically stay the same, never put yourself in a position to feel uncomfortable, well, then you can hide out and rationalize losing. The best way not to lose is to follow the seven-step listing process from day one, and that way you're going to ensure that you will immediately uh, be seen at, because you're, you are operating at a completely different level than all your competitors, even the most grizzled veterans. And I will say this to the grizzled veterans that are listening, you guys are the ones that we are the most worried about. Because new agents, frankly, they don't have anything to unlearn. They haven't been spoiled by this ridiculous seller's market for a long period of time. They're not going to have to have, uh, once they follow one court, like a a new agent or newish agent who is finally deciding to be a listing agent, they're going to say, okay, tell me what to do and I'm going to do it. And they're going to do it. And they're going to do it. A more grizzled veteran agent, they're going to say, you know what, I like Tim and Julie's way, but... Yeah, you know, I'm going to interject a little this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to change this. I'm going to da 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 And I mostly get it off my personality anyway. And yeah, and that's what, and then you're going to wonder why I didn't take the listing. And then you're going to rat, and then you're going to go there and tweak it. You're going to go in there and mess around. You're going to make it too complicated. Our system is simple to follow. It is elegant and it gets you consistent results. So do not deviate. We want you, for example, with the scripts, we do want you to memorize them. Uh, We want you to internalize them, memorize them, but then we do want you to personalize them. We do want you to make them your own, but before you make them your own, you have to learn actually how to say them. All the scripts, the listing presentation, everything is written in such a way that it gets you consistent results. That is how real businesses operate. You want to be a real business operator. Next point, Julie. Next point, number eight, you didn't use a pre-listing package or your pre-listing package looks like everyone else's. Without a great proven pre-listing package, you're signing yourself up to hear objections at the end of your presentation instead of closing at the end of your presentation. Handle all objections before you get there using your pre-listing package so that all you have to do is talk about pricing, answer questions, your light presentation, and close. This is a major differentiator between hobbyists and professional listing agents. Sellers do know the difference. So when you don't handle the objections up front through your pre-listing package, and then you try to close, of course, it's not going to work for you because the sellers have been hanging on to all those objections while you were talking, not listening to what you were saying, and then they're going to blast you with their objections and you're going to lose. Right. So the importance of a pre-listing pack is the difference between you taking the listing and not taking the listing. The pre-listing pack that we designed that's been obviously honed and perfected over the last couple of decades and always is being updated is designed to work in, in any market in any price range. And it, it is essentially your silent salesperson. It's doing the heavy lifting for you prior to you actually showing up at the seller's house. You do not want to walk into a seller's house with them not knowing your marketing plan, them not knowing about your commission, them not knowing about your listing term, them not knowing about your days in the market, them not knowing about your list to sell price ratio. You want the seller to know everything there is to know about you prior to getting there so that when you walk in there, it's essentially just putting a price in the listing contract, answering a few lingering questions, and then you're done. And I have news for you. They don't want you in their house either. No. Not for long. They don't. Point number nine. Point number nine, maybe you didn't close at all. If you find yourself walking out the door saying, okay, I'll follow up in a few days, that's not closing. Remember the definition of closing is the logical ending to a great presentation. And remember that your presentation 
began when they became a lead. You are presenting, you are competing by the fact that you pre-qualify, by the fact that you bothered to ask questions of pre-qualifying. You are competing because you sent not just the same pre-listing packages as everyone else, but a really killer one that pre-handles all the objections. You're competing when you do show up early instead of showing up late. You're competing because you dressed the part. You're competing because you asked what was most important to them, presented to that, and then closed. And you mentioned something a couple seconds ago where you're talking about don't park in the driveway. Yeah. There's so many little micro points that you need to know to be consistently successful because oftentimes you will get the listing just because a lot of these little seemingly inconsequential things that you were doing add up to something really huge. You've differentiated yourself. The reason the seller is going to list with you isn't because of the number of people that follow you on Instagram. They're going to list with you because you've proven you've earned the right to be their, their, their listing agent. Julie mentioned don't park in the driveway. And I'm going to tell you guys why. I meant to a second ago. Here's why. Because a lot of times you're going to have two working people in a household. You're going to get there at 6 o'clock. You're going to park in the driveway. Turns out that the husband or the wife who have had an extra long day, maybe they're, maybe they're picking up Johnny or Susie or the dog from the vet or whatever, they get back home and you parked in their driveway and now they can't get into their garage. And now they're pissed. And now they're pissed. And they're going to walk in and they're going to give you the stink eye and you basically set the table, you've set the stage for you not to get the listing because of the fact that some, you know, you parked in the driveway. And even worse, sometimes they'll actually ask you to move your car. Yeah. How about that for bad mojo? So when you're in the process of really becoming a powerful listing agent, follow all the steps we teach you in the coaching program. The coaching program, obviously there's links. You're listening to us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or you're over on our YouTube channel. The links are right there. It's very easy to find. Just scroll down or you can just text the word premiere to 47372. Text the word premiere to 47372 or just go to premierecoaching.com. Next point, Julie. My number 10, maybe you overdid the pre-qualifying. That usually happens once they start pre-qualifying. And talked yourself out of the listing appointment. Were you looking for reasons not to go on the appointment or looking for how you can meet the seller's needs? That happened. We talked about that a little bit yesterday when they say a price after you've used the pre-qualification questions that maybe wasn't your exact CMA price or maybe their motivation wasn't exactly spot on. But that's not the reason the agents will actually talk themselves out of going on an appointment. The reason you guys talk yourself out of going on an appointment is because you don't know how to do a listing appointment. Yeah. You did not pre-qualify. You did not send a pre-listing pack. You listened to this podcast the last two days, and you know right now the market's going to hand you your ass. Do something about that yep. so that you actually are excited to go on appointments and you walk out victorious. But there's all kinds of little psychological things that will oftentimes uh, stymie your performance. And here's another one. You get a call out to go on a listing appointment that's five times the house uh, price that the house you live in. You guys will then somehow rationalize that you're not worthy of taking a listing that's in that price range. Or it might be on the other end of the spectrum where it's really cheap and you decide not to take it. Here's the rule that we give to all of you guys. Every single seller is should be every single one of your listings. In other words, if they have to sell, you have to list it. Period. Yep. End of conversation. You don't have to love the house. It might smell funny. It might not have the best curb appeal. But if they have to sell... You have to take the listing. We have so many stories, and I won't bore you, of <laughs> agents who, I'll give you a, you know, went out and listed some arbitrary, or not even arbitrary, it's not the right word, some little, you know, goofy double wide, or they listed some piece of farmland, or they listed something that never going to sell, I might as well take it, whatever, whatever. They weren't excited about it. They sold it, and it turns out that that was the niece to like somebody from the, you know, the Walton family, and now you're listing houses for Walmart. You guys get the point? So those are the types of things that happen when you're a listing agent. They don't happen on the buyer side of things. Because, I mean, Julie and I had that experience. We got All some, the time. We got some little, you know, we called it the duck blind, a house made of concrete blocks that was down by a river. It was a our, for sale by owner made out of cement in the floodplain. And our broker laughed that the best use of the house would be making into a duck blind for when people want to go hunting on the river that was right there, which, by the way, the house would flood about every three years from the river overflowing, okay? Not at a super exciting <laughs> listing at first blush. No, and, you know, but it, and it was a FISBO, and she wasn't successful getting it sold. She called us out. We got the listing. Turns out she was the personal assistant. Just somebody at, I forget which company it was, you might remember. And he, this guy ended up not only giving us his listing, but we got all kinds of business for years from having actually listed the duck blind house. Yes, absolutely. and And she did, um, there were other agents that she'd called that didn't even call her back. Nope, because they didn't like the looks of it or the location of it or the price range. Of it. I think it was like 50 grand or something. It was nothing at the time. Well, it was a concrete duck blind, but still. <laughs> there was nothing to it. Yeah. And you remember we ended up uh, helping it have curb appeal by putting some stucco on the outside, adding some shutters and some flower boxes. 
that stuff matters too. Actually, Julie, the house you're remembering is a different house. <laughs> always also on the duck blind street, but it's a different one. Yes. But, and I, I believe that she was the assistant to a guy that owned or ran a car dealership. And then we got not just li his listing, but we got both sides of his listing. Then he bought something. It, I mean, there were like five or six more expensive, more interesting deals attached to it. And it goes on for years. Because we were nice to her and yeah. we helped her out. And, we, and she accomplished her goals. Why? Because we seller contacts us. We contact seller. We then pre-qualify seller. We then send pre-listing pack for seller. We then show up and go on the listing appointment. We follow the listing process. We get the listing paperwork signed. We follow a process every single time, no matter who the seller is, what the price range is, no matter, it does not matter. Every single seller has the exact same, same experience every single time because then you get, the, you get the exact same experience when you're obviously trying to scale up your listing side of your business. Imagine if you went to Google and every time you went to Google, it was a different experience, right? Where the hell am I supposed to put my search inquiry, right? Yeah. It changes. The blocks moves around and the sometimes it's a circle. You. Exactly. <laughs> you guys get it? It's insanity, but that's how most of you run your business. Point number 11. Point number 11. You weren't prepared for any or all of the common objections and they're always the same. Some mixture of these. It's in things like, I've never heard of your brokerage, or I'm considering bigger name or different name companies. And that goes both ways. Sometimes people mm -hmm. will be in sellers will want to list with little, you know, Bob and Sally's boutique. They might have preconceived notions about a big brokerage or a preconceived notion about a small brokerage. You need to know how to overcome those. And part and parcel of that is if you're competing against teams. So if you're mm -hmm. a single agent and you're competing against teams and you're intimidated, not a difficult objection to overcome at all. Matter of fact, I'll say this in teams, you're not going to like me saying this, but it's true. Teams are oftentimes the easiest people to compete against because the preconceived notions the sellers had about that uh, working with that team. And we're giving you, obviously, in the coaching program, you give all the scripts for that. Now, if you have a big team and you're worried against competing with a local expert who basically is very socially involved, you should be because those are oftentimes the toughest agents to actually beat in a competitive listing appointment. You're going to have to know how to compete with that agent respectfully. So in case that seller has some sort of you know social connection with that other agent, you're not going to make them mad because maybe you're you know trying to puff yourself up because you have this big team and this is just an individual agent. You guys get it? You can compete no matter what. Next objection, I'm going to probably list with the neighborhood expert or specialist. Now, there's two sides to that. We coach you how to deal with that if you are the neighborhood specialist or if you are not the neighborhood specialist. There's two different scripts. The next one is I'm considering listing with my friend. You might hear I'm also interviewing the agent who sold me the house. It's very common. I'm not sure I can move since there's nothing for me to buy. We've done entire podcast series about that, and we're spending a lot of time with our coaching clients. By the way, you don't that. get any of these once you pre-qualify the seller and know what their motivation is. Yep. When you know what a seller's time frame is, you have to sell the house by when you have won the game. Yes. Now, here's a scary one. Why do I, if I'm the seller, why do I have comparable sales data that you don't have? Yep. Okay. Now, here's the secret. Always... Because you use the pre-qualification script, which asks this question, always research your competition. Who sold them the house? Who markets their neighborhood? Whom did they say they were interviewing when you used your pre-qualification script? You did use a pre-qual script, right? Another secret, always know the stats on those agents. What's their expired rate? How long have they been in the business? How many listings do they sell versus buyer sides? Do they have any suspensions on their license? Of course, the biggest mistake of all is not having enough lead generation in place to have many listing opportunities so that you can earn while you learn. Now, why do you want to know all that competitive? How are you going to know who you're competing against? Because you're pre-qualified. You know that you're competing for that listing. You know who the sellers are also considering hiring for the job of being their listing agents. And you positioned yourself to be the third agent that they're interviewing. Hopefully, there's not more than that. So you followed our process. You've now done everything correctly. You know who your competition is. You now know who you're competing against. Go into the MLS. Find out what they sold. Actually find out how many homes in their price range, in that same price range they've sold. You're going to find a lot of cases that the seller does not know that the agent that they're also considering um, listing with only works with buyers and only works with buyers like during three months of the year and the rest of the year they don't work. They don't know that. You want to show them that if it's necessary in a competitive listing appointment. We do want you to prepare. We do want you to know, uh, to give the seller all the competitive information they should have when they're making a decision who they're going to hire to be their listing agent. Some of you are going to be mad that I just said what I did, and that's okay. Be mad. Instead of being mad and just being mad, become more competitive because that's what this new market is going to demand. Do not be mad and then do nothing about it 
to essentially prepare yourself for more competitive listing appointments. And then when you lose, blame anyone else other than yourself for not being prepared. That's right. I'll give you a quick example of that. One of my coaching clients in Long Beach did the pre-qualification script, found out that she was up against the kind of the uh, area commission cutting person, okay? And did some research and found out that that, because she had the exact name, found out that that agent had only sold 12 homes ever and that 11 of them were buyer sides. Is that person a listing agent? No, they are not. So she did that because she used the question, she found out who it was, and she used that, and she ended up being very competitive and taking the listing. Here's the thing that's also fascinating. A lot of you have been brainwashed into believing that your reviews on Pick the Site are more important than sales stats. Not true. Know your competitor's sales stats. Know your sales stats. Now, if you don't have any sales stats, then use your broker's sales stats, but do disclose to the prospective seller that, you know, this is, say, with your, you're with EXP Realty. And let's say EXP Realty is one of the top three brokerages in your particular marketplace. And let's say you don't have a lot of experience selling homes. Use EXP's uh, statistics from having sold the homes that, that EXP's listed and sold in that particular marketplace. And then use those numbers and just say, we don't say I. Don't we were be, involved in. Right. We were involved in our brokerage EXP Realty was. You guys get it? You have to be prepared. That's what this market's all about. And you'll find, again, what happens when you're professional, you start getting really, really excited to go on appointments. You know, mm -hmm. someone commented that I talked too fast on yesterday's podcast, and I'm sure I did mm -hmm. today, because here's why. I love the listing aspect of real estate. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. the only thing I miss about real estate. I know. We live vicariously through our listing we, agents. We totally I, I do. love their victories. It's so exciting. Well, I love, I, Julie, I remember so many, our best experiences in real estate were always during competitive listing appointments. We are, frankly, uh, yeah. you know, competing against some, you'll never beat them type. Oh, they've been in the market forever. Mm -hmm. Or that person, you know, they're going to name streets after that person. And they're going to carve a picture of them on, you know, on an effigy on Mount Rushmore, whatever, whatever, right? Julie and I would love competing with people like that because 99% of the time they were complacent and they were entitled mm -hmm. and they actually weren't trying to win the seller's um, listing. And when the seller were to meet with us, I remember when you and I, changed markets and we went to a New Albany Country Club area. Mm -hmm. So we went to an area where the average sale price was like 5x what our price was for, for a few years we were in real estate. All the agents there were basically blue blood as you could be for our market. They had gone to elite schools. They went to Paris for the summer. They all knew each other. A lot of their kids went to the same private schools. Not Julie and I's case at all. No, and we were probably 10 to 15 years younger than them at the time too. Yeah, we were. And yeah. we were, and we looked like we would, you know, we're we were the, the paper delivery people. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Back when newspapers got delivered. You guys get the point. <laughs> yeah. So we were able to win, you know, and I'll, t I'll even make it more complicated. Um, it was in a different market. It was a market where we had no sales. And a lot of the people in this community were a different religion from us. So you would think from the outside, looking in, no way in hell Tim and Julie will actually get any traction there. No. Well, not only did we get traction, within the first 18 months, we became the number one listing agents in that marketplace. Why? Because we did what we preach. I remember from, we, we actually, um, when we started working that market, we started, uh, knew we were going to hit the market running in the spring. And so we started hunting the expireds. Yes. And we started calling. We did everything we teach these guys And to we do. did a lot of previewing. We went yep. to open houses. We got to know the market. You know, we got to know the country club. We did our research. We did everything that we're talking to you guys about. And by the way, we had virtually no center of influence there. I remember how snotty and nasty those agents <laughs> were to us. Yeah. And how they were like, oh, you have to be at, you know, New Albany Realty in order to take listings here. And it was just one thing after another. And the more... Uh, they kind of talked down to us and were condescending to us. The more we got frankly motivated. It, it motivated us, like, please tell us more, give us more nasty vibes. It totally is what we live off of. Yeah. And, and so over the winter, what we did was we were uh, going after the expired listings. And when the spring market hit, we put like 12 listings for sale all with inside 30 days. And that existing aristocracy, that sort of elite class of agents were just blown away. And we never lost momentum after that because all the sellers and neighbors saw who the hell are this Tim and Julie. And now why did the sellers list with us? And this is what they told us. We go on the appointments and like I said, a lot of them were expired and they were so happy to have what they felt was a viable option to all these, you know, Paris traveling 
Presumptive. Um, presumptive, not very, frankly, skilled, not very professional agents who are getting most of their listings from the country club. Julie and I went out there and we were taking their business seriously. We we're showing them what we we're going to do to get the property sold. We are going above and beyond. We are actually working on the nights and the weekends. We we're actually, you know, talking with them over the holidays when these other agents told them to take the houses off the market because there's no activity, mm. which the reality of what was the agents just didn't want to work over the holidays. You guys yep. get it? This is how you differentiate yourself. But you have to start with the idea that you win by being professional. There is no reason why Julie and I should have succeeded in that market. None whatsoever. But we took a professional approach. And I don't know if you remember this, mm. but um, NAR, National Association of Realtors, uh -huh. I uh, found out what we did mm -hmm. and uh, did a nice little article. I remember the and, pictures in front of our house. Yeah, pictures in front yeah. of our house. Yep. yep. About us having actually done that. And it uh -huh. was, I forget what the title of the article was, but that was. The, I don't remember. Yeah. But you know, so how did we do it? I think uh, we led with expireds because we didn't have any past clients nope. there. Okay? Or centers of influence. We didn't have any center of influence there. Uh, so definitely led with expireds. Once we took a few expired listings, and guys, you don't have to list 10 at once. You Once you get just one really great listing. And work it. And work the listing, one thing will lead to the next. But even while we were doing that, we were still going after expireds. We did some work with builders, new construction, and we had a little bit of relocation going on. But the combination of those spokes and working each active listing and having furiously fast lead follow-up with the buyer calls and the relocation calls and all those things, that broke us into that neighborhood that, as you said, we really had no business being in. I remember when we were going from, like, there were different price tiers. The upper end, obviously, has different price tiers, too. And most of the listings we were listing would be the Midland. The expireds were happening in like the 800 to 1.2 right. range. Mm -hmm. But then we started getting call outs for the ones that were significantly more money. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was intimidated as hell, frankly. Yeah. I tell lots of stories about that. But the sellers were the exact same. Yes, they the way were. They asked the same questions. They had the same exact thoughts, same exact hopes and fears as the people that we had originally helped when we started selling real estate and across town with the $200,000 houses. Well, that's because when, you know, we were talking about finding out what's important to the seller and, and presenting to that, that is true no matter what price range, no matter what their personality style is, doesn't matter if they have motivation and they have to move, they have the same concerns. You know, it's the timing of the move. It's the communication you have. It's your pricing ability. What are you going to do for them? A lot of it's energy and enthusiasm too. A ton of it is energy and enthusiasm. Yep. And focusing on them and making it all about them and not making it all about you. <laughs> we could tell stories forever, but we won't. So guys, hopefully you're motivated to really drill down and become listing agents. This is the best opportunity in real estate. I will say at least the last 15 years because you can win through skills um, even if you don't have, you know, like the story we just told you, even if you don't have a bunch of deeply rooted center of influence and past client relationships in this marketplace, you can still win through skills. You can still win through actual hard work. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> you know, honestly, <laughs> who, knew? who knew? So listen, guys, thank you for continuing to make this number one list to daily podcast for real estate professionals in at least the United States. We'll talk to you on the show tomorrow. Hello, thank you for having watched this video. Please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's right, and don't forget to hit that like button, leave your comments and questions below, and we will get right back with you. Thank you for watching this video. Remember to watch the next one. You're gonna love that one.